Good morning, everyone. On this uh, Independence Day holiday weekend, um, we are going to be looking at Judges chapters 15 and 16 in the life of Samson. But as we get into it, our opening prayer will be from Psalm number six. And um, I'm going to read from the, the new uh, Psalter book, um, the introduction of, of this Psalm six, a uh, paragraph describing it. Then we'll read uh, out of the EHV, Psalm 6. There's 10 verses in the and a prayer uh, from this. So uh, Psalm 6, it says, The church sings Psalm 6 as a call to confession or a prayer in times of severe illness. Psalm 6 is the first of the seven penitential psalms. Martin Luther said, The sixth psalm laments the acute hidden suffering of the conscience because of sins. David is tormented by the law and the anger of God and is driven to despair. But at the end, the psalmist sees that his prayer has been heard, and he is a trustworthy example for all those who find themselves in such affliction. So as we read this, uh, Psalm number six, it uh, seemed that with the life of Samson that we've covered so far and going to be getting into today, a penitential psalm uh, is definitely something that applies. Um, not just for the great sinner that Samson was in addition to his uh, judgeship, but for uh, the sins that I think of as well um, in, a, in every aspect of life. So Psalm 6 reads like this. Do not rebuke me, Lord, in your anger. Do not discipline me in your wrath. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am fading away. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are trembling and my soul is terrified. But you, O oh Lord, how long? Turn, O oh Lord, and deliver my soul. Save me because of your mercy. For in death, no one remembers you in the grave who praises you. I am worn out from my groaning. I flood my bed all night long. With my tears, I drench my couch. My eyes are blurred by sorrow. They are worn out because of all my foes. Turn away from me, all you evildoers, because the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. They will be put to shame. All my enemies will be terrified. They will turn back. They will be put to shame in an instant. So this is God's word and the prayer. Lord, when our sins overwhelm us, help us turn to you who truly bore the weight of them all, because you endured God's anger, assure us that the debt of our sin has been paid in full. Hear us because of your tender mercy, so that the devil dare not accuse us, but must flee in shame. For you live and rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So maybe if uh, anything from Psalm number six comes up in the or you think of it in our study today, go ahead and offer some thoughts uh, as well. Um, so if review from the life of Samson so far, does anybody want to give me anything that uh, stood out or that you've learned about Samson in our last two sessions? Something that stood out in a way that didn't before or something that you learned that from his life that you hadn't uh, considered before? All right, nobody has anything, that's okay. So we'll, then I'll have to do the review myself. Um, we didn't do it uh, uh, when we covered it last week, but uh, Samson uh, could be tracked in his life, at least one, a couple of sections of it as Samson settling scores, revenge, a vengeance. Um, and from the end of uh, chapter 14, I have it up on the screen, um, when Samson killed uh, the 30 men because they uh, because of the riddle with the clothing. He's settling scores round one, getting them back. And then the Philistines hit again. Uh, chapter 15, the, the wheat harvest. This is round two. Uh, the torches on the fox's tails, right? And then settling scores round three was then after uh, the burning to death of Samson's wife, who had been given to another. Uh, that's uh, round number three, and the and that continued then the uh, yeah that revenge uh, settling scores round four is what we're going to get to today. Um, 
and we kind of finished up with after round three when he um, when he ripped them apart, uh, ripped them to pieces in verse seven, a devastating attack. We have Samson in, in hiding. Um, and these actions of the Philistines, I got it on the notes on that page up on the screen, might not be on your page. I think I reprinted that. Um, that the actions of the Philistines hardened Samson's attitude. And he was going to continue to settle scores until he exacted revenge. Um, we're not, com we're not con told to be vengeful, but God did use Samson's vengeance for his glory and for his purposes. But please don't use Samson as an excuse to go out and pay back an eye for an eye. Um, we have a, a different different aspect to guide us. So uh, any questions through that quick review of the settling scores? Okay. Uh, Mark, would you mind reading, um, starting at uh, chapter 15, verse 9, Meanwhile, the Philistines, and um, take it down, take it down to verse 12, okay? Down to? Yeah, through, we go through verse 12. Oh, okay. Meanwhile, the Philistines went up and set up camp in Judah and occupied the territory around Lehi. The men of Judah asked, why have you come up against us? They said, we have come up to tie up Samson, to do to him as he did to us. So 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cleft in the rock of Edom. And they said to they said to Samson, don't you know that the Philistines are now ruling over us? So what is this you have done to us? Samson answered them, as they did to me, so I did to them. They Thanks. said, okay, yeah, I, go ahead, please. <laughs> they My said bad. to him, we have come down to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourself. So we'll pause there just a moment. And uh, what, any impressions there of the, of the men of Judah um, in the situation? Yeah. yeah, very respectful of their judge. Not respectful of their judge. That's one way of putting it, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is the Philistines. You catch, they're trying to sell scores too, right? As, as he did to us, we're going to do to him. We're going to tie him up. Uh, he actually did more than tie them up. So, uh, uh, so they, they were not just going to tie him up. This was going to be uh, putting him to death was their goal. Mark, looks like you want to offer something. The, uh, the men of Judah were looking out for themselves, not out for everyone. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we and we, we have Samson being vengeful. He's self-centered too. Here, he really, really is. Uh, um, we see that coming through. And the Israelites, I was gonna in my notes, I said that really cowards, right? They're looking out for themselves. They're not respectful of their judge, but it's it's really cowardice. Um, the Philistines had that show of force coming at them, and and uh, turn Samson over or else, right? And so, yeah, they were quite satisfied if their Philistine, their godless rulers, would just let them be. Just leave us alone. We'll be underneath you. Just, just leave us alone. And Samson, we don't want the freedom. Mark? No, okay, right. yeah, okay. All right, so um, it's a far cry thing in my notes from being a kingdom of priests, right? Kingdom of God's people, the way God had told them they were as they left Egypt here, uh, Exodus chapter 19, they were, they were called. Uh, Carol, comment. All of this started just because Samson wasn't paying attention and doing what he should anyway, going after a Philistine woman. And so, again, it's the consequences of sin that messes everything up. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, and to, to back, you know, we see God's hand through all of this, and it doesn't, 
It doesn't excuse the sin that's been prevalent in a part of it, right? That God used the Philistines to punish his wayward children Israel. But the Philistines uh, don't get off scot-free because God's using them, right? They're, they're responsible for their sin. So he raises up Samson to be a judge uh, and stop the Philistines. But Samson's sins in this, even though God uses them, they're not excused, right? The, the answer is for forgiveness in, in the Savior, which is God's whole point here of preserving his people so that the Savior would be born according to the promise. Um, Sue, please. So the, the um, Israelites haven't really repented at this point either, right? I mean, they, our God would... Um, yeah, we don't, we don't have the whole nation of, of Israel repenting or even a tribe coming forward in repentance. We have... We have Samson standing alone, really. And we, we have Israel really just, okay, we're content. We can't do anything. Uh, they're not trusting God to rescue them, not trusting his promises. Um, and, and kind of just taking the easy road. Why is the path that leads to destruction, right? It's the easy way to go. Um, we did early in a couple of places in Judges, we had that cycle of national repentance. Um, and, and I'd have to go back, and it's probably worth, worth me doing that. I don't know how easily I can scroll back here on my pages. Um, from the beginning of Samson, did it with Manoah? Did, was it that Israel came in full to repent here at the beginning? I don't think we caught, I, I don't think I, we see that anywhere in chapter 13, the beginning verses that um, that Israel repented. We have they sinned and they were in the hands of the Philistines for four years. And then we're presented with uh, Manoah and his family and the birth of Samson. So just kind of a that concept, uh, glad Sue mentioned that because we really don't have uh, national repentance here in the life of Samson, at least that I recall. Any thoughts on that from anybody? Okay. Um, anything else in that section? All right, Samson, uh, why does he ask the, the leaders of Judah, who came at him with 3,000 men, right? Definitely can, can beat one man. And yet, the good ploy, yeah, one man can do us at least a little bit of damage, maybe a lot of damage if he's Samson. So we're going to negotiate first, even though we have 3,000 armed men. Um, and uh, we're going to hand you over to the Philistines. Why does Samson say, swear to me, you won't attack me yourselves? I guess we're kind of in the middle of that conversation. So in order to answer that question, let's, let's move on. Uh, Carol, would you go ahead and uh, read verses 13, and four, 13 through 15? So it's two paragraphs, if you don't mind, Carol. Carol, I think we got you on mute. My mouse must have hit it again. Can you hear me now? Yes, we got you. Go ahead. Okay. They said to him, we will not. We will indeed tie you up and hand you over to them, but we will not kill you. Then they tied him up with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When Samson came to Lehi, the Philistines came to meet him, shouting a war cry. But then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson, and the ropes around his shoulders were like flax, charred by fire, and the ropes melted off his wrists. Samson found the fresh jawbone of a donkey, reached out his hand, and took it. With it, he struck down a thousand men. So now, why, why did Samson ask them if you know, swear, ask them to swear, swear to me, you won't, uh, you won't attack me yourselves. Still had his limits. He knew who, who his enemy was. He didn't want to be killing other Israelites. And so, all right, I'll give myself over to you. He, he agrees. He's going to let them take him as long as they don't attack him. Right. They tie him up. I, I don't think I, New ropes, because they're not brittle, old ropes that have been used for a number of years on the farm, they'll fall apart pretty quick. But the new ones, um, 
but they, they became, uh, with Samson, became like charred flax. Uh, that little candle wick, after it's been burned, it really is just powder. That's really what we have, what we have here. Um, yeah, struck down a thousand men with the fresh jawbone of a donkey. Um, and uh, let's, uh, John, let's wrap this up. Samson has his own uh, summary here. Would you mind taking the poetry, the Samson's riddle again, verses 16 and 17? If you don't mind reading for us. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. And so it was when he had finished speaking that he threw the jawbone from his hand and called that place Ramath Lehi. Okay, so thank you. Um, yeah, the Riddler and the, the poetry in the Hebrew, I, I, and I'm not even going to uh, undignify the Hebrew by trying to pronounce it for you, but the, we'll tell you uh, the Hebrew word for donkey and heaps, it, it sounds alike. It's a, it's a play on uh, uh, on words, a uh, play on a, a little, would it be alliteration or whatever grammatical term that is where you, uh, yeah, the sounds are similar, but the meaning is different. Um, and it makes, makes for fine poetry. Um, and it's actually the, uh, the the word for uh, the word for uh, well red comes in there too jawbone jawbone is actually the red bone the red bone jaw and so it means there's blood in there as well and that's similar so there's a third word that sounds a little bit alike so a lot of sounding repetition not exactly rhyme but the Hebrew and got rid of the jawbone that killed a thousand men. And uh, job, Jawbone Heights, how about that for a subdivision name? And any, uh, any thoughts on Samson's uh, poetry here or anything else? Yes, I have a comment. Yeah, please, John. This is probably clear to most people that the, jo the Old Testament, Joseph, the purpose behind uh, the persecution of jo by Joseph's brothers uh, would be similar to the uh, what's happening to uh, or um, the sin of I'm sorry the sin of jo Joseph's brothers and also the sin of Samson were for God's purposes. Yeah, God used them, and yeah, and your your comment about uh, Joseph and his brothers these are the children of Israel, right? Those twelve children of Israel and. Centuries later, their descendants are like just like their fathers, right? Um, misguided, mistaken, uh, sinful, uh, not chosen because they were better than the other nations, but chosen totally out of grace. Uh, no, well, so, oh, yeah, my, John, go ahead. Well, my point was um, what the point you made earlier about the purposes of God behind Simpsons, more specifically Samson's sin. Um, and then, um, you know, the purposes behind the sin of Joseph's brothers for, uh, for Israel. Yeah, um, uh, and I appreciate that, John. And you are right. Um, one thing that in my mind, you know, I, I, I anticipate people saying, well, why, why would God have this purpose? Did God, did God intend for the sin to happen? And, and that's not a conclusion we can make. Right. God didn't want the sin to happen, but um, God's purposes are for the good. God's purposes include the gospel. So when it comes to the word sin, I never say it was God's purpose that somebody sinned. But I'd rather, and if you'd like, allow me to use your word and just add a prefix. God repurposes sin. He changes the purpose and he turns it for his good. Uh, and that is his gospel. So while I, I totally understand what you're saying, uh, John, I, I, the phraseology I like to be very careful with because um, we want to make it clear that God, if God is not sanctioning the sin. And I think that's your whole part of your whole point here as well. Um, while God uses it, he's not sanctioning it. 
Thank you. Repurpose. Uh, I like that much better. Thank you for that uh, for that insight. Okay. And anything else here, uh, Sue? Please. Um, his poetry is self-glorifying instead of giving God the you know the reason that he was able to do that. He doesn't put God in that equation. Yep. Uh, yeah, I is there, and what did I? Uh, and we'll see that coming up here. Uh, this this vengeance uh, scene uh, number four that we had uh, before us. Um, yep, yeah, it definitely see uh, his settling scores. That that's really it's selfish here and self glorifying. He's not glorifying the Lord. Um, so let's see. Sue, have you had a chance to read yet? Well, if you take, uh, I guess, the end of the chapter through verse 20, you got one Hebrew word and a few are name, location. If you want to skip that, I'll read it, but you can always try it if you want. Uh, 18 to 20. Then he became very thirsty and he called to the Lord, you placed this great victory into the hand of your servant. Shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Then God split the hollow that is in Lehi and came out of it and came out of it. Samson and, and water came out of it. Samson drank, his vitality was restored, and he was revived. For this reason, he called the place Hekora, which means in Lehi to this day. Samson judged the Israel, Samson judged Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Yeah, and, and you read exactly what my mind wanted to say, which means what? En Hakora, what does it mean? Well, it actually remains in Lehi to the writing of this, but the En Hakora is, is the spring of the one who called. So that's in my notes, probably in the, the footnotes of your Bible. Uh, the one who called out. Well, Samson called out to the Lord, and, and the Lord answered with, with that spring. Um, and what happens when these self-centered accomplishments hit a pothole or get a flat tire on the trip? Exactly the opposite of self-glorification, right? Despair, impossible. How am I going to overcome it? And I'm done for. Um, look, look at the mood swings when a person uh, is self-centered. -self self-glorification, then switching to despair. And, and he's thirsty. Okay, I wonder how thirsty you have to be to... Uh, to when you're Samson to respond that way. I'm a bit thirsty, but I could probably make it a, a day without water if I had to. I shouldn't, but um, but yeah, so very thirsty after that victory. And and his what do you make of his prayer? I think it's some prayer. First of all, he he in all of this reading, he has glorified himself for his battle. He doesn't thank the Lord for his victories or recognize that his strength is from the Lord. And now you say, not, now, now he's feeling sorry for himself. More than anything, that's what comes out to me in his prayer. Oh, woe, woe is me. You've forgotten all about me. You don't take care of me. It just, it's kind of childish it is very childish um because you you're right up till now he hasn't glorified the lord um because of the victories it's been awesome i'll take the glory but then when the victory has a little bit of hardship oh that's what okay now god you gave me this victory and look at how hard this victory is all right um look at all the trouble that comes because of what you gave me to do um so even even the giving glory to the lord in this prayer falls far short because he's usually it's kind of a backhanded way of blaming god god i'm going to glorify you but in the same time i'm blaming you um i'm gonna and all my purpose your all your purposes for me are done for i'm gonna die but how does god respond to even that woefully inadequate prayer <laughs> yeah he provides provides him with with the water um and and that uh, not many events recorded in the next 20, uh, in the next 20 years, um, the days of the Philistines, but the Philistines were in control. And I believe this time period of the Philistines, uh, earlier in the book of Judges, we said that it was a, uh, the Philistines really ruled for 40 years. So Samson seems to have brought some period of stability um, 
maybe a, a standoff over those 20 years um, during, the, during that time, but the Philistines were still ruling. So that gets us through uh, the end of chapter 15. Does anybody have any questions for me? Uh, this is a technical. Please, John. Um, uh, technical, my audio is cutting out, so uh, you may lose me. I've, I've lost audio several times, just in case if I don't respond, that's why I still have video though. Okay. Well, and if you miss anything, you can always check out the recording later and, and that, but thank you for letting me know. And now I lost my place here on the screen. It was not your fault. That was my fault. Uh, so chapter 16. Um, Kathy, would you like to read, I guess it's uh, uh, verses one through three, so kind of the introduction, introduction to chapter uh, 16. One time Samson went to Gaza, there he saw Goliath standing there with his men. People of Gaza were told Samson is coming there. So they surrounded the town and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. But they relaxed during the night, saying, Let's wait for the light of morning, then we will kill him. But Samson slept only until midnight. He got up in the middle of the night, grabbed the doors of the city gate along with the two gate posts, pulled them up cross court, bar and all, set them on his shoulders, and took them up to the top of the hill opposite Hebrew. Okay, so, uh, yeah, we could really see chapter 16 starts off, uh, could be subtitled, and in my notes I have that Samson tempts God at Gaza. Uh, how is he tempting God? Well, he went there, that's Philistine land, one of the five main, main cities of the Philistines. Why did he go to Gaza? Not to fight him. He, he was choosing to commit a sin. And why? You know, could he not find those services anywhere in Israelite territory? Maybe, maybe, maybe just, just trying to look for a reason to get the Philistines uh, or, you know, an opportunity. We don't know. Maybe we shouldn't speculate even about, but it is obviously choosing to go to Gaza. He's going to go to Gaza later and not by his own choice uh, near the end of his life. Um, the doors, just a little bit of how the doors work. Um, you know, in my mind, I picture the doors of a medieval castle and, you know, hinges and, and nailed into the wall and, and whatnot, probably a little bit of a different uh, aspect, not so much uh, framed and hinges on the doors, but the big the, the posts of the doors would have been um, actually poles that were very big, thick poles or tree trunks that had the whole door on them. So they would have been set with a rounded bottom in a rocky, on top of rock with another group, you know, kind of like a bowl that the tree would fit on. So in that situation, it's really heavy and it would just swing, easy to swing, but he basically just lifted it up. So he didn't actually have to probably break any of the framing and hinge work. Um, or wall, but just lift up such heavy, heavy material and carry it to the top of the hill. So, yeah, and why the Philistines, when they had him trapped, waited? Well, let's wait till he's groggy in the morning after, after his, his long night, and he will, uh, he will not be able to defend himself. But he sneaks away in, in the middle of the night and gets away. Um, comment, yeah. So, so was he locked in the city? He had to break out. And yeah, they, yeah, he would. Yeah, he was locked in. They they surrounded the city, laid in wait, um, and, and locked, and locked it. Uh. Again, it showed the <clears throat> Philistines in their type of manner is that they had the force, but yet they waited and uh, to get. To try to get the advantage, but they actually they were weakening their themselves. Yep, got this. The, yeah, this military mind and waiting to gain the advantage, but they really gave gave that advantage up. Yep. and got got twisted around uh, that advantage of force and, and gave it gave it to Samson. Um, all right, so 
Yeah, so beginning of verse 16, uh, th this, is the, you know, that this is not Delilah yet, a uh, prostitute here in chapter 16. Now we're going to have in verse 4, uh, Samson's introduced to Delilah. Uh, we are introduced to her. Um, so uh, just verses 4 and uh, well, let's take 4 through 7. Uh, Mark, would you mind reading there? Sometime after that, Samson fell in love with a woman from the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. The Sarans of the Philistines approached her and said, persuade him to reveal where his great strength comes from and how we may overpower him, tie him up and humiliate him. Each of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me what the source of your great strength is and how you can be tied up in order to humiliate you. Samson answered her, if anyone ties me up with seven new bull strings that have not yet been dried, I will become weak and like any other man. Okay, so yeah, just gonna pause in the middle of the story and just a few words of introduction here. What do we know about Delilah? Kinda, not a whole lot. Um, it's actually a Hebrew name. It nowhere says she's a Philistine. She might have been Hebrew. Okay, we, we don't know. All of his trysts and encounters before were with Philistine women. So there's some assumptions there. Uh, her name, Delilah. Uh, not exactly sure what it means, but, but if you take the, the last, I believe the last four letters of the Hebrew, you have the Hebrew word for night. All right, so this is nighttime. And then there's some connotations with everything that uh, that nighttime involves, and the, the events of darkness, and the the mystery, um, and, and and the sins of night uh, is kind of left hanging there in, in that name Delilah. Uh, the first half uh, is uh, is actually the word humiliate. Uh, first, actually, first three letters of uh, the Hebrew word for humiliate to bring down, and um, we're going to see that, yeah, she definitely does that with Samson, right? Brings him low, but it was also a word that was used to indicate the flirting behavior of a woman attempting to win her man. Okay, so, so yeah, the, Delilah, in the Hebrew meaning, Hebrew meanings of the name has everything, I think, that uh, we that we associate with her the life of, of Samson. So just a, a bit there. Um, verse five mentions the Sarans. Uh, and we talked about that, I believe, earlier. Um, that's a proper noun when on our Bible, I think lords of the Philistines might be how the NIV or the uh, King James would have translated that. It's a proper noun because it was a specific name given to the main ruler of each of the five Philistine cities. So um, each one, so we're guessing that there were five of them, and each one promises Delilah 1,100 shekels of silver. Um, I, I looked it up. I don't know if uh, your footnotes in your Bible has, has the, the total weight, but 1,100 shekels is probably three years' wages. If a shekel was a weight of, of a silver equivalent to one day's labor. So, yeah, we have three years wages, and then you multiply that times five, five uh, sarans of the Philistines, we have 15 years worth of wages uh, if Delilah hands them over. So um, we do, we, 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 Delilah is not Samson's wife, nor is she a prostitute, but she winds up being obviously someone who loves money more than her man, right? A mistress who, who loves money more than her man. Um, no, Sue, comment. Um, they must have been fairly desperate to promise, you know, to use a woman and then to promise that kind of a reward. I yeah. mean, that's huge. Yeah, um, desperate, prompt that reward shows desperation. But from Samson's history, do you think using Delilah sounds like uh, they knew it was past life? Right. right? Uh, they probably heard about his wedding and how, uh, how the riddle was solved, right? The, the, the guys, the, the attendants go to, go to the bride uh, and the woman's going to be able to get it out of them. So, 
so that we do have that. Let's go on with that story. And I think, uh, Carol, could you read eight um, through eight through 12, if you don't mind? Okay. <laughs> so the Sarahs of the Philistines brought her seven new bowstrings that had not yet been dried, and she tied him up with them. She had men hiding in the room waiting to ambush Samson, and she said to him, Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a flax thread that was scorched when brought near fire. So the source of his strength was not revealed. Then Delilah said to Samson, look, you made a fool of me and told me lies. Now please tell me how you can be tied up. Samson answered her, actually, if anyone ties me up with new ropes that have never been used for work, I will become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new rope, ropes and tied him up with them. Then she said to him, Philistines are upon you, Samson. There were men hiding in the room waiting to ambush Samson, but he tore the ropes off his arms as if they were thread. Okay, so we have the first two events uh, of the wilds and, uh, and just kind of thinking it through after these two events, can you have an, want to answer and in, in part uh, or guess what was Samson doing? What was he thinking? I don't know. I don't think he was thinking. And just, I can't imagine, you know, even, even in the movie itself, he is that kind of arrogant. I mean, the, the actor that played him really did a good job, but it's it just like, how many times does this happen? I mean, she's not even subtle about it. It, it just, it's almost like, I don't know, I'd like he's even possessed or something. Yeah. Was he being fooled by Delilah? I don't think so. I think he's playing a riddle game. He is self-sufficiently thinking, I've got this. Um, you know, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna play around a little bit, joke around, and then make her make her a fool. He, I think she's right. He's obviously making her a fool. She's trying to trick him, and he's making her a fool back. There's some vengeance going on, but what's he doing? He's trusting in himself. He he's come through it. The rope can't tie him up, um, and uh, and we're gonna just keep on going with uh, the third time uh, versus. Uh, Sue, would you take us to the end of verse 16? Okay, 13 to 16. Delilah said to Samson, So far you have made a fool of me and told me lies. Tell me how you may be tied up. So he said to her, If you, if you weave the seven locks of my hair into the fabric of a loom and fasten them with a pin, I will be as weak as any other man. After she had waited for him to fall asleep, Delilah took the seven locks of his hair and wove them into the fabric of a loom. She fastened them with a pin and said to him, Philistines are upon you, Samson. But Samson woke up from his sleep and pulled out the pin from the loom along with the fabric. Right. Yeah, to take uh, two sixteen. next paragraph. She said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? This makes three times you have made a fool of me, and you have not told me where your great strength comes from. This was how she tormented him with her words day after day and nagged him until he was sick to death of it. All right, so, and so foolishly, we see Samson getting closer to the truth. He involves his hair, but really ridiculous, you know, uh, you know, take my hair and uh, weave it into the fabric of a loom and put the pin in there and, and then I won't be able to do anything. I'll be weak. Um, no. But what, what is he doing? I think um, at taking that question, I put a little bit of my thoughts, you know, the, the riddle teller has a weakness for women, obviously, but he was not a fool. He must have known what was going on. Uh, he was playing with her, but what was he doing? He was holding on to a fatal illusion. He just said, I'm invincible. You know, he had that gift from God of strength, but the invincibility um, was, was his fatal illusion. And um, it leads to some nagging and some torment as it's the sick to death of it, as it were. Um, 
And unfortunately, we're going to have to put it on pause until next week because we're running out of time. Um, yeah, but can you can you hold that thought? I'll, I'll give you a minute or two if you have any uh, concluding questions or things that you'd like answered next week. Anybody have anything? All right, we'll close with prayer. And uh, I didn't bring up Psalm number six yet, but uh, we definitely Sam see Samson and his sinfulness, and he is not brought to repentance yet. His only prayer we had was was a, was God responded to his prayer for water with grace, but um, but not the we don't we don't have his his repentance as it is yet. And, and obviously, you know the life of Samson, so uh, that that is coming. Uh, but let, let us go to our Lord in prayer with repentance. God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, study today and from the life of Samson. Uh, lead us to learn many things, um, how we are not self-sufficient and how we need you. And, and over and above all, O oh Lord, bring us to repent of our sins daily, that we may place all of our trust and salvation upon you and all of our trust in you for every day to give us all that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining and us today. Holiday.